So when thinking about AI, sometimes it makes sense to look at the here and the now, the tools right in front of us, how it's changing the world today. But sometimes it's more fun to look at tomorrow or next year, or even five years, 10 years from now. How will these massive leaps in tech impact the future? That's the spirit of today's episode of AI Curious. My name is Jeff Wilser. I'm a journalist, I'm a human, and I'm curious about AI. And I am delighted to be joined by Allison Deutman, the CEO of Foresight Institute, an organization that's all about, well, the future. Allison basically has the coolest job on the planet. <laughs> the Foresight Institute was founded in 1986, and its mission is to support the development of cutting edge tech. Like so cutting edge, it's in the early, early stage. So early, it sounds like more sci-fi than reality. Their theory is this tech often will not develop on its own because it's hard to get the financial incentives for things that are 20, 30, 40 years away. So Foresight is focused on things like nanotech, longevity biotech, neurotech, space exploration, molecular machines, and yes, of course, AI. Now, to me, this is one of the most thrilling, truly thrilling aspects of AI not just the ways it can help us do our jobs 37% faster or cut costs or even to do cool things like magically creating videos. Yes, that's all important. And of course, we cover it plenty on this pod, but it feels like there's also a deeper, more fundamental shift at play. It feels like AI is making what once felt impossible, possible. Things that were only science fiction a few years ago like realistic humanoid robots, that's now on the table. So what can this mean for the future? Allison and I get into all of this, how the tech can potentially help us live not just longer lives, but better lives, healthier lives, richer lives, and can help humanity live better lives and can make the world more inclusive and extend the abundance and riches to millions or billions of others. Like That's what's on the table here. Now, there is a lot of doom and gloom about AI, and there are very real risks, and the Foresight Institute is also involved in helping curb AI risks. But today is about the other side of the coin, the sunny side of the coin, to mix metaphors. Here today, we're exploring some tech-fueled reasons to actually be optimistic, to be hopeful. So with that, please enjoy my conversation with Allison Goitman, CEO of the Foresight Institute. Allison, welcome to the pod. Hi there. Thanks a lot for having me. Let's jump right in with a vision of Foresight. Since 1986, you guys have been supporting, not you personally back in 86, but the Foresight has been supporting future tech, if you will, for the benefit of humanity, not tomorrow, not tomorrow's tomorrow, but perhaps years in the future. So Talk a bit about your vision for how technologies like nanotech, biotech, and AI could reshape our world in the coming decades. Yeah, I mean, I guess that <laughs> we could be here all day yes. if you want to get into it. So, and I also want to say I'm not a scientist in any of these fields, but my role is at Foresight. I, I run Foresight.org, and I basically am the cat herder <laughs> of various scientists across different domains. So what I can do is give you like a peek into these fields or like a bird's eye overview of them and, and maybe point a few like highlights that I think are, are really interesting. Perfect. I am not a scientist either, but the, my, my role is similar to cat herding is to talk to scientists and talk to cat herders and get a sense yeah. of what's exciting without like necessarily going into the 17th level of the tail for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think what Foresight's role is quite interesting because it's like, it's not just focus on one science or technology to drive progress forward on that, but it's pretty interdisciplinary. So we have these different verticals, longevity, biotech, neurotech, nanotech, space, and AI slash computing. And so we really focus on like driving progress at the intersection of these fields and then within each field kind of like at the frontier. And so whenever you see a technology kind of like gaining traction, the frontier kind of moves outward, like mm -hmm. the mainstream kind of like moves into that field. And, and But then there's still a lot of work to do at the frontier. So I think 
uh, that's kind of like our role in these technologies. Uh, so we specifically focus on supporting science that is perhaps not otherwise supported by the legacy institutions <laughs> uh, for various different reasons. But yeah, so I think, I mean, maybe just like going through one by one and we can dig into any of the ones. Well, 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 yeah, you're right. I mean, there's obviously, this could be a 10 hour conversation yeah. just discussing the visions. I, so I know it's a lot to tackle all at once. Let's Maybe let's start with what are the three or four main like next phase tech that, as you put it, are maybe not supported currently robustly in any mainstream way that you guys are trying to, to cultivate and nurture along. What are the three or four that are kind of most on your front burner right now? Yeah, well, I'm going to bracket AI then for that. We can maybe get back to that later. But perhaps starting with longevity biotech, it's not like we were interested in longevity biotech since pretty much our foundation. And I remember when I came to Foresight, we had one of the early workshops where we brought people together working on longevity science. It was probably six or seven years ago. And it was literally in like in, in a small workshop room next to a squash court <laughs> in some kind of like gentleman's <laughs> club in Palo Alto. And at that point, the field of longevity was really pr quite small. So everything in longevity was at the frontier. But then over time, of course, what you see now, you have like longevity pop-up cities. You have uh, so mm -hmm. many people coming in, like real funds that only focus on longevity now. Uh, and then like Sam Altman uh, and like lots of other billionaires really pouring their wealth into longevity. And so the longevity ecosystem per se is perhaps not undervalued, but within longevity, I'm really, really excited to push perhaps a bit more on the niche area. So for example, one big one would be cryonics. <laughs> and I know that this is like a really weird one to start with because it's pretty out there. But if you bite the bullet or if you accept that maybe dying at the point that we're already dying is not the best that could happen to us. Maybe we want more freedom uh, of choice uh, about when to decide when we actually, when we're done with life. Once you kind of like accept that longevity is something uh, to strive for, then I think most people kind of fall into the second bucket of, oh, okay, well, longevity is important, but you know, let's focus all on longevity companies that currently exist because we're totally going to make it through. And I think mm. that's just not really totally apparent, like pending AGI arrival timelines, mm -hmm. let's break them out for now because I can't really for sure say when they're going to come, even though timelines are short. I don't think we're going to reach longevity escape velocity, which basically means that when you add more years to your life, then you subtract in our lifetime. And so I think we need to think about weird mm -hmm. options like cryonics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and cryonics basically means like vitrifying your body after you're dead, or you can be a neuro patients only, in which case it's only your, your brain or like mm -hmm. your head. And then waiting for a time in which in the future we have the technology to revive yourself again. And so that is really uncomfortable for people, for people to think about, even if they're interested in longevity, perhaps especially if they're interested in longevity, because at that point they will have accepted that. Yeah, it's you know, almost like admitting defeat. It's almost like if you believe in longevity, you're like, oh, oh shit, we're already yeah. saying we, now we, you, we, we blew it, we lost. <laughs> yeah, now you care about longevity and you admit defeat. So well, I think this, this to me feels, I mean, to borrow a financial model, like good portfolio management, right? Yeah. Where, where you're, you're hoping that we can extend our lives by X years. And of course we can have debates and discussions of, okay, is this, is this the, the pros and cons of longevity and the merits and well, what are the, what's the resources required? And is this good quality of life and health span? And I, I, I can, I can appreciate all of that because I'm, I'm sure listeners are thinking, wait a second, do we want to live to be 120 years old? What's the downsides of that? Fair. But to your point, Allison, if we do want to focus on longevity and we, and, and I'm guessing you also mean quality of life, not just yeah, quantity of, of life course. for sure it still makes sense to think if we don't get there in 20, 30, 40 years and you're not, and I'll raise my hand. I'm someone, I, I don't want to die until I have to. So I think it's really reasonable to think about, okay, what's a head strategy. What's like a, what's a way to boost our chance. Even the, even the odds go from 0% to 5%. I still think 5% of additional life over 0%. So to me, it's quite logical. Well, I, I would say it depends really with chronic technologies how you count the percentage because the current state of them, I'm not even sure if you have 5%, but oh, I'm, I'm saying that, it's zero right now. I'm saying if you, if, yeah. if, if we, if, if there's tech in play yeah. that can help us go to 5%, great. <laughs> That's better than certain death and being six feet under just in, in, That's in true. my book. Yeah. But I, I would say that even if you sign up to chronics now, the, probability that you will actually get revived as well. The idea is also that even if you sign up now and you get vitrified with the current techniques, it like 
we, we're not very good yet at preserving the brain. Yeah. But nevertheless, you could also just say, well, if you get preserved with the current techniques, it may just take a lot longer because we may have to wait until we have advanced nanotechnology to kind of like repair yeah. the parts of your brain that were damaged during the yeah. replication process. And so maybe the earlier you get preserved, the longer it may just take you until you're being revived in the future because we need more advanced technologies yep. to repair the damage that has been done by the very premature technologies that we currently have. And anyway, I, 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 as, as a quick aside, and for listeners, I, I, I love that there might be folks listening who thinks it sounds like science fiction. My contention would be that's often how science and tech and innovation works. It starts out by sounding like science fiction and eventually gets more and more plausible and eventually gets early adopters, and eventually gets mainstream, right? And I think what's so cool about Foresight is you guys are choosing to focus on the most out there sounding stuff and helping it go from sci-fi land to actual plausible to mainstream land. And then the cool thing is once it gets mainstream, you're like, okay, we're, we're actually, <laughs> it's in good hands now. We're going to move on to the next cutting edge thing, which is why I think there's some tech that probably 30 years ago is are focused on now it's at Best Buy. So, <laughs> okay. So I, I cut you off. So Cry Cryer is one you focus on. What are a couple other cutting edge sounding like sci-fi tech areas you guys are focused on that you're very excited about right now? Yeah, I mean, like another really big one that we focus a lot about is the newer tech and especially like the newer tech and AI intersection, like both of them, I think are really, really important, especially, I mean, newer tech, people have been interested in that field for a long, long time. We definitely didn't put it on the map by far not. It's a really, really rich, longstanding. Can, can, can you briefly kind of define what neurotech is and give an example or two? That yeah, I mean, on to? I, the, the field is so broad that like one example, I think doesn't quite cut it. But in terms of what we focus on with the neurotech, we really focus on whole brain emulation. So this is neurotech that does not exist yet. Uh, and so the idea of whole brain emulation really is that, well, so brain, sorry, brain emulation. Did I get yeah, that right? Yeah, emulating gotcha. a human yep. brain. Obviously, you would start probably with other model organisms. You can probably do like a fruit fly, then eventually perhaps something like a mouse, uh, and then get yourself, or build yourself up to, to a human. But this is not something that exists yet. I want to be very clear about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does not exist. But nevertheless, like whole brain emulation was always the sci-fi future dream that was always seen as maybe like 30, 40 years ahead. Like people really didn't take it quite seriously until lately AI advances actually made people look again and were like, well, actually, maybe we can't do it the way that we thought we would do it very early stage because that's mm -hmm. still really quite difficult like to actually like to slice and map different parts of the brain and then upload this static structure. But what if we can actually um, use AI techniques to fill in the blanks where we don't perfectly mm -hmm. know how, let's say we can't, probably create the entire connectomics of a given brain. But th that's kind of like the idea that AI progress could possibly help help with the, some of these aspects at least. And so on the other hand, AI progress is also making some of these whole brain emulation advances a lot more urgent because if you, ask, if you had asked me maybe, I don't know, six years ago, why would we want whole brain emulation? <laughs> why is it even desirable? Right. I would have maybe said something like, well, it's great for digital longevity. For example, if mm -hmm. you're a chronic patient and you are neuro only, your way to survive is by becoming a whole brain also, upload. Also neural, I've never heard the phrase neural only before. That is hilarious. I love it. It's basically saying and, someone a neuro just... patient. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, can yeah, sign yeah. up you're... to be a neuro patient. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's one. Another one is whole brain innovation would have like fantastic insights into questions of like consciousness and like other philosophical yes. questions that we struggle with for a long time. Another one would be thinking a bit further out that for space exploration, it's quite unlikely that like our mushy actual human flesh yeah. can, can travel there. And, and for that matter, also not our human brain, but maybe an emulation, like uh, a computer emulation, a di digital emulation of our brain could go there. And so those are a few of the reasons why it's interesting or why it has been interesting in addition to many of the medical insights that we gained along sure. the way, <laughs> of course. Sure. But it was just never really practical. But like recently, with AI progress speeding up, it hasn't only be become uh, perhaps a little bit more feasible, but also possibly much more urgent. Because if you now ask me, why would we want a whole brain innovation? I would say, well, timelines, like AGI timelines are coming down a lot. People yep. are quite worried about creating these like alien intelligences that aren't really built on the way that humans uh, are intelligent and sentient and the way that we interact and show up in the world. 
nor are they built with our, our evolutionary forces and pressures in mm -hmm. the back, nor are they built on the same substrate. <laughs> so they really don't share very much of very much of what makes human humans. And we're like artificially trying to teach them human values right. one by one. And so maybe it would be better to have these like uh, emulations of a human brain that if you could have a full emulation of a human brain and it would actually reliably run forward, you already have an artificial general intelligence, which is a human <laughs> based and then potentially, I'm guessing you could then augment and improve it, right? Is, is, is that where you're headed with this? Is, yes. There's one, there was one school of thought that, okay, it's inevitable. AGI will happen. They will not be a bit smarter than humans. They will be like 1,000, 10,000 less smarter than humans. To think we'll be able to kind of negotiate with them. Hey, hey, little AI guy, we're going to teach you how to be like nice, like humans and not kill us all. To think that is naive. Therefore, the only kind of real politic answer is to modify our own brains. And to do that, if I hear you right, brain emulation will be a critical path on that journey to, to basically get us to be able to compete with our new potential AI overlords. Yeah. <laughs> like it, yeah. I mean, whether you say compete, some also say merge, or yeah. integrate with, because once you're on a digital substrate, there are <laughs> like the, the, the boundaries between you and others are just a little bit more fishy in general. So yeah, I, uh, the, the Borg, Star Trek, the, the queen. Borg. So, and, and, and the idea is that you could even just, for example, having a human brain and then running it faster, like basically like with mm. more compute, actually like running a human brain much faster, that would already give you like quite a bit in terms of an intelligence increase or like at least an, in, an increase in problem solving ability for a specific task. Uh, and there's actually a really interesting book called Age of M that was written by Robin Hansen. And he basically applies an econ economist lens to a future, a near-term future in which we have emulations of human brains and basically discusses how would a society and an economy and politics work and like also life, death, sex yeah. work yeah. if we are emulated. And well, especially, and especially if, scare, if, it's no, if it's not scarce anymore, right? If, if, my, if your brain can be emulated once, presumably it could be emulated 5,000 times. And so when we have 5,000 Allison brains out there, it gets very tricky, very quick. And maybe that's when you bring in, oh, the NFT, your brain. We need to have a <laughs> digital yeah, scarcity then, of your brain. <laughs> but then also who's holding it? Is it still my biological self who's holding right. it? Who cares about the biological self at that point all that much? I mean, in the in the very far future, of course. We would we, we would still care about biology for some time. Yes, yes. I, I, right. I would so, I would hope so. So we got we got cryonics, we've got Bring emulation. What are a couple other tech cutting, maybe like next, 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 next wave tech that you're really excited, you're really excited about right now? Yeah, maybe I'll, we could chat about nanotech and or AI. Yeah, let's, let's go. I, I, was, I was hoping you bring it up. Let's go nano. Okay, so, cool. Yeah. Let's, let's do nano first then. We were founded on the vision of molecular nanotechnology, of a vision of like really advanced nanotechnology. And like back in the days, that was kind of the technology that people were more focused on in the Bay Area than AI. And then mm -hmm. over the years, the, the book that said Foresight on the map was called Engines of Creation. And in that, our co-founder, Eric Drexler, laid out this really advanced vision of a future that is defined by molecular nanotechnology and AI technology. And so if you think about molecular nanotechnology, it's basically like what a computer can do to bits, molecular nanotechnology can do with atoms. And so basically by rearranging matter on a really precise molecular, possibly even atomic scale, uh, you can basically build with incredible precision from mm -hmm. the bottom up many structures that are currently impossible to build, like new materials. You could build things that we can already build much cheaper, much, much, much more waste, less, possibly much faster, just by virtue of the fact that you actually have more precision about the feedstock that you're using to build things. Mm. And so if you think about a molecular 3D printer, you can already pretty much build with a molecular 3D printer, like a lot of the things that you can imagine that perhaps possibly before that you weren't really able to get that all that easily. You'd have to like, I don't know, hire someone, <laughs> Uh, a designer to design you something that then eventually goes into production process and eventually arrives at your door. And with 3, 3D printing, well, you can build a lot of the things that you can come up, up with. But you can design them yourself and then print them. And so molecular 3D printing will be doing that, but with incredible precision and incredible detail, really with the feedstock that we're using. Just, yeah, sorry, so just, make sure, just make sure I have that, just to kind of bring us home for listeners. So if I hear you right, if I wanted to currently build, I'm looking around my, my kitchen right now, like a, a toaster or, or something like a cutting board that uh -huh. would require normally you have, you bring in like 
you have always slabs of wood, you have always plastic and some pieces make the final product. Some don't, there's waste involved. So the entire process has so much churn materials that are ultimately are not used with, you're saying that with nanotech and molecular construction, there's no, like the piece of a two by, obviously my toaster is not wooden, but the, the, the serving tray that I want to build is right. And so perhaps now there's like blocks of two by fours that is very dumb and you cut off certain edges and only part of the wood is used. Part yeah. of the wood is, is, is thrown in the ground. So with nanotech, it's just not only just like the quarter inch that's used, it's like the, at an atomic level, the teeny tiniest bits of matter that's the bare essentials for whether the cutting board or my toaster, it's all it's used. So it's ra not just a bit more efficient sustainably, but radically multiple yeah. levels more efficient and in theory more sustainable and can unlock different types of creations in the first place, not just my toaster serving board. Am I getting that right? Yeah, you're kind of like really on the fundamental tiniest scale, only using what you need. Mm -hmm. Currently, like the feedstock or resources that we use have a bunch of stuff in it that's not necessarily relevant for the things that we're trying to build. It's more mm -hmm. like kind of dead weight loss. And if you could actually just be precise about the like the feedstock that you need to build specific things, you can build not only much more sustainably, but you can also build materials with like new properties, for example, much stronger materials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that would enable uh, and unlock a lot of futures in space because the biggest cost in space is weight. <laughs> right. um, uh, I guess like mass really uh, to, to that extent as well. But so, so it's, it's more sustainable. It's more waste, less wasteful, more wasteless, I guess. And you can build like quite new materials. And that obviously has also possibly really big effects on like other technology like AI, because mm -hmm. if you can really build chips with a lot more accuracy, but really a lot more precision than, I mean, mm. the current chips are already amazing. Like I, like I, I watched this video about actually how, how chips are being produced and I'm, I can't really quite figure out how we were able to get around to doing that as a civilization. But now imagine we could actually do that only with the very precise piece of materials that we'd have to use for this. You could possibly build a lot more competent or a lot more like AI that is just a lot more effective with a lot less costs. So I think energy is important, an important input, input for, for compute, but possibly also like actually just building compute with a lot more precision that would be, that would possibly have pretty big impact on AI, which could then again lead to better design tools. Better nanotech, people. lead to better, yeah, better AI, better and nanotech, and nah, 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 nah. Wheel. <laughs> so to, 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 to what are appetite, Alison, what, what are some other examples of how nanotech could be used to improve our lives. Uh, one I'm thinking of top of my head is drug discovery and creating drugs, right? At a molecular level, could certain like proteins and drugs be built through nanotech or could nanotech be actually used to repair our bodies, right? So could little tiny little nanotech robots go instead of having this like old school surgery where a doctor like cuts open your arm, could nanotech little, <laughs> envisioning little miniature doctors with little, <laughs> Yeah. Lab coats on nanotech go into our arm and actually, at a more refined level, create more precise surgeries and potentially help us fix heart attacks, things like that. What, what, what are kind of some of the other yeah. possibilities? Well, in I, guess, case? I think we're still somewhat away from actually like agentic nanobots, <laughs> and to some extent, they're also not really they're not necessarily what the field is like actually focused on <laughs> right now. I think <laughs> okay. they're, they're often this, that vision that people have in mind, but A, nanobots also bring their own risks because especially if they're self-replicating, you have like runaway risks. And then B, they're also just not super practical to build. <laughs> it's not yeah. necessarily, there are some like, I guess, medical advances that like call themselves nanobots, but you know, they're not, not really the little doctors that, that I guess you <laughs> imagine. I mean, these are like cute little glasses on and stuff. They have like a little miniature, right, right. <laughs> yeah. And to some extent, I, I still get emails sometimes from people that are like, I have nanobots in my brain, especially when COVID hit, can you oh, help wow. me? And, and so I think the whole nanobot thing, I'm not sure. I, I'm just not sure if A, it, it's super realistic to think and about it. And, and, and when you're saying it's not realistic, we know it's not realistic. <laughs> I mean, who knows? It's, it's definitely, it's, it okay, might so, so I, I, let's, I, let's retract my wild nanobot inside the fixed surgeries thing. Uh -huh. What are some other use, what are some other nanotech use cases that excite you? Yeah. I mean, I do think, for example, if you think about a path or like a relevant technology for developing molecular nanotechnology, like a path for that is that at least some people are exploring right now, 
whether or not it's going to be successful is a different question. It's like really precise, like protein engineering, and especially that for drug discovery, like amazing, possibly. And I think that, for example, again, that's really enhanced by uh, AI tooling that is coming online. So, for example, David Baker uh, and his lab at Washington University, they kind of like came up with Rosetta, uh, which was mm -hmm. uh, partly building on like some of the AlphaFold 2 um, alpha full to successes, but also like adding their own, own touch to it. And so I think maybe from a drug discovery uh, perspective, this like more protein engineering route could be, could be interesting, maybe also mm -hmm. for other like biological applications. But yeah, like I do think that for drug discovery, it has pos potential for better materials. It has potential for improving compute. It has potential. Mm -hmm. And then through that, a bunch of different energy applications even environmental applications kind of like fall from the wayside especially on the material end of things mm. and even if you just think about being able to produce anything that we physically use with a lot more precision less waste cheaper than we currently do like the uh, impact on the economy is just really quite marvelous <laughs> currently we're just like really so constrained so even if we just get better at building mundane things even just without lifting our gaze we would just be ending up in a pretty abundant like in, in a ph physically abundant future of course we're not quite there yet i think a big problem with nanotech is that for any specific thing that you're trying to build or f sorry for any specific application that you're trying to achieve let's say it's about a drug or it's about mm -hmm. anything else there's often like a quicker way to get there rather than trying to do a general purpose way mm. where I actually like so there's no so there's them. no one particular field that's incentivized to really focus on this right so 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 there's no nanotech champion necessarily it's, it's just if you ask what are we what would you what do you need computers for give me one yeah. application with computers and it's well there well, are kind of everything <laughs> yeah and, and, and that's i think pretty much what nanotechnology has to offer for the physical world it's not quite as universal because we're still we're, we're within the laws of like physical constraints and some things you can build some things you can't build there are resource constraints time constraints cost constraints but in principle it's pretty general purpose and so there's never really one incentive to create that for a specific application that you want. <laughs> and so it's almost like this public good that once created, it can be repurposed for lots of applications, but in, ex in order to create it, it's just really complicated. It requires a multidisciplinary uh, process of various different subfields. So for example, at our nanotech workshops, we have people coming from protein engineering, DNA nanotech, normal organic chemistry, mm -hmm. from computer modeling and simulations, physicists, people work on STM, AFM, like basically just like the fields are quite diverse. You, you would think that a company, you would think that a very deep pocketed company would have enormous incentives. I mean, you would think if they, whoever cracks the code nanotech, that is like the ultimate cash cow, right? That is like this company instantly becomes the most valuable company in the world, or perhaps second to the company that, that figured out AGI, right? <laughs> so there's the AI company super cycle and there's yeah. the nanotech and both of them feel like, I'm, I guess I'm surprised to your point, we are seeing this arms race for AI advancements mm -hmm. and understandably so. I'm surprised given the enormous financial upside, there's not some, there's not like five competing nanotech super companies, each one led by like massive billionaires, right? I, I'm, I'm kind of shocked to be blunt. Elon Musk doesn't have a nanotech company. I'm shocked Jeff Bezos doesn't, right? What, I'm shocked what, too. Yeah. <laughs> Consider me shocked. <laughs> All right. We'll get him on the horn and we'll figure, we'll figure this out. But I'll, I'll, or not all kidding, most kidding aside, what do you, given that, given the kind of tricky and challenging incentive misalignment there is here, how far out in the future do you think nanotech is? The, the kind you're describing, being able to drug discovery or helping build my toaster or my wooden serving tray in a more efficient way. Is this, do you think this is five years out, 10 years out, 50 years out, 100 years out? Well, you're very upset about your toaster. Someone needs I, to buy you a toaster. <laughs> I, so it's actually a fine toaster. I, it's just happened to be the first thing I saw. I don't know why I'm picking on it today. Apologies, toaster. So... <laughs> It, it, one day it will wake up or probably through Alexa or whoever it might already be listening to you and might take its revenge. So, yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh, you're right. I, and now, Allison, now you're, I'm going to have nanobots in a brain thanks to this too. <laughs> They'll get their revenge. Oh no, please have another one of these. <laughs> Wait, um, but, 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 but seriously, yeah. are we like, what rough order of magnitude? If you had to bet some, not a lot of money, bet a bit enough money to go to a nice dinner. What, what, what are we talking about here? Are we five years off, a decade, 20 years, a century? Oh, well, it also, I mean, it depends on your definition and then it depends on how much money 
but and and the big one is it depends on ai progress because better design tools will allow you to do nanotech much better and then of course one ai doom scenario is that ai just discovers nanotechnology and gray goose us all which i think is mostly like a dystopian sci-fi narrative than anything real but okay well i am trying to remember the last numbers I got from people that actually know their stuff about yep. this, <laughs> yep. because honestly, I am not the correct person to ask about this, but I think it was like an effort of a few billion dollars over the course of a few years could lead you to something where at least you have a working prototype of a working prototype that would get enough investment to make it, to turn it more into a flywheel <laughs> discovery process. But yeah, I don't take my word on it. It's really... It's no, that, really that's helpful. Even the fact that we don't know, I think, is telling as far as how far away we are from it actually being a reality. It's still super, super, super exciting. Okay, what, what else? How about biotech? Let's biotech and then let's get to longevity. I know longevity has been, and we've already kind of touched upon this yeah. a bit, but I know it's been a passion of years over the years. Let's talk biotech and longevity. What kind of areas, and we mentioned, we mentioned cryo just up the top, but what else excites you in a longevity field these days? And what else do you think, what, what's the average person not thinking enough about and that are kind of sleeping on as far as exciting longevity science down the pipe? I mean, like there are, I guess, two fields. One is personal longevity and like really trying to, you know, I guess, maximize the chances of like you yourself being around for a little longer. <laughs> and you can do that easily, at least to the, to the extent that we know how to do it. It doesn't take all that much to get a head start on it. The first thing I would say is just try to do a few of the aging tests to really get some biomarkers on your age. And there's mm -hmm. not one biomarker of aging yet that I would really trust. But by cross-correlating across different uh, tests, you should be able to get somewhere to even just see how old are you biologically, mm. really? <laughs> and how much do you have to worry about this stuff? And some stuff comes out of there where you're just like, oh, damn, I'm doing much better on this metrics, much worse on these metrics. And that just really helps. So I think like prevention, 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 measuring, tracking, changing your diet, changing your sleep, less toast, that would be really useful. Yeah. Unless you, I guess, take European bread, that's a little bit better, but <laughs> Americans don't eat American bread, basically. And yeah. And then I guess you can do a few more of the more experimental stuff, but even just like working on your sleep, having glucose monitors, like all of this kind of like personal longevity bits, that's easy enough to do, I think. And enough people are doing it now. Like you have the rejuvenation Olympics now that Brian Johnson is running and people are really like getting kind of excited about it. So I think we're on a okay path, but that's not really going to kind of bring us all the way. I, I just don't think we're going to make it into longevity escape velocity, by just doing the things that we're already doing a bit better. So ultimately mm -hmm. we need novel drug breakthroughs maybe gene therapies and so forth. And I think like on a larger scale, zooming out, what could really accelerate the kind of foundational progress in longevity biotech, they are coming again to AI. And so <laughs> I think there was this really interesting review of like new AI for bio tools by Sarah Constantine that just came out. And she basically goes through all of the new AI for bio companies and it's just, okay, this is good. This is not good. This cuts down the research process. This cuts down the experimentation process, la, la, la. And I, I recommend for people who are interested in that space to really check it out. But like a few that just came online is from Future House, for example, they have a really good AI scientist that they just published and they have a big biology focus. There are other areas, for example, Brain GPT is a, a GPT that is trained specifically mm. on neuroscience literature. And that's pretty good actually for the neuroscience part of brain aging. <laughs> but then you also have like other bits, for example, like Elicit, which is like a research, research assistant that really just like helps you do research much faster. And so I think in general, I'm quite excited about like better AI tooling for like A, helping you research uh, longevity stuff much better and bring more people up to speed because the field, even though it's growing, we still have to onboard a lot more people for this to get uh, to work faster. And AI, I think, can be a big, big help with just Im improving the research process. And then B, AI for drug discovery ultimately would also be amazing. But look, we're just, it's, it doesn't really seem like, like it, it just doesn't seem like the US is quite serious. Like if you just look yeah. at FDA regulation, it just, even if we had something that could possibly work, the amount of time that the amount of money that we need to spend on a few trials to try to see if we could get it through the FDA and like possibly like by targeting an endpoint that isn't even relevant for longevity. It, it just seems like even the, the entire meta environment of doing scientific research mm -hmm. in universities where you just mostly get directed to more near-term incremental advances. Like even the NIH doesn't really focus on aging. And then the NIA as part of the NIH 
even though it's the National Institute of Aging, doesn't really focus on the really important rejuvenative and preventative things. So I think we're just not taking the product seriously enough. And so I think we need some real kind of like governmental either reform, and there's a few nonprofits out there, for example, like Alliance for Longevity Initiative that is trying to lobby the government, just being a little bit more longevity positive. But then also maybe by just increasing jurisdictional arbitrage by going to places like Prosper, which is like a charter city in Honduras, where you can already do a few of the gene therapies that are currently still illegal in the U.S. And so maybe by by just increasing the competition that the U.S. has for holding good companies mm -hmm. or frankly, their their population, maybe that will wake people up. But yeah, I think that, that it's just a really big problem. Like even if we had something that could possibly work, getting it to a stage where it does and where it reaches the masses is uh, just very expensive and really non non-trivial. <laughs> Uh, non-trivial is is the the perfect word. Um, on on the non-trivial fronts, how about but climate change? Obviously, the listeners are concerned about climate change. I think if you you ask the average person, they think about the world's biggest problems and whether the world would be better or worse 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now. They might say worse because of climate change. I'm love that you have a hopeful view of the future and you look at tech that is improving different dimensions of our lives, whether longevity, whether space exploration, is there tech out there? Maybe that doesn't exist and is not mature now and won't be five years, 10 years, but is there any kind of dollops of hope you can give folks who are concerned about climate change that is on your radar? Okay. I, in 30, 50 years, will be better equipped to do X and that will help us in the days to come. Yeah. I mean, 30 years is hard to think about given AI timelines, like in the Bay area, people have short timelines uh, or like many, at least meaning like, I think on Metaculus, which is a prediction platform here for predicting the progress of various different technologies. But for example, one of them is AGI and I think the median or the community prediction for when artificial general intelligence will arrive is by 2030 or something. Mm -hmm. And so 30 years is, I don't know. Like, sure, sure. It seems well, I, 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 okay, so forgetting, I, 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 <laughs> right. I guess forgetting my timeline, that's not, that's not fair. Yeah. More generally, I guess, is, is there, you have su such a good sense of exciting possible tech that could come in the future, right? Not <laughs> immediately, but down the road. Any, and, and, and maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's what we've already covered. Maybe it's nanotech, maybe it's AI. Do you, are, are there hopeful tech solutions you see out there that can be brought to bear for climate change, whether it's like carbon capture, but in a much better way or something like that? People have definitely talked about nanotechnology for carbon capture, but like even just, just staying with what we already have, we have nuclear power. <laughs> Yeah, um, and we're finally <laughs> being becoming a bit more ready to use it. It drives me AI crazy. <laughs> we have abandoned nuclear power. I could spend well, but, five hours going in a rant about that, but that's an aside. But, but people are people are back on it. Like now, um, Bill Gates. You know, yeah, Bill Gates. But even I think wasn't it Microsoft or like the ones that are trying to. What is the American site called again? Three miles. Oh right, right, right. Yes. So that's new and that that is driven all by by the need for energy for AI progress. <laughs> Ironically, <laughs> yes. So, so in some sense, that was very useful. And I remember because, for example, one of our previous presidents, Josh Stores Hall, he wrote this book, Where's My Flying Car, which got pretty big. And it's basically about this collective future of if only we had nuclear power and nanotechnology, imagine where we'd be right now. And it's like a very different world. And he's basically just going on a rant about like how we messed up on nuclear power and i really do <laughs> believe we totally did i mean as a german i mean germany totally dropped the ball on this it's, it's really quite i think it's sad and embarrassing especially not not really across europe france is doing a little bit better but i feel like it's really empowering and great that the us is finally getting its its act together again mm -hmm. and and investing in, in nuclear power and again largely driven by private corporations it's not not necessarily only a government effort it's like really driven right. by the need for energy for compute so that's amazing i'm really happy about that and obviously that's not going to solve drawdown and that's not going to solve all of it but that would be a really big step for a better future and one that we could have done like 
years ago, <laughs> many, yeah. many, many yeah. years ago, but we refused to do so. What, on to that point, Allison, what kind of synthesizing a few different, different, a few of these different threads now, what is the biggest constraint? What's the biggest challenge in seeing these exciting high potential technologies getting greater investment and adoption? Cause you, you, because what's so interesting about Foresight is you guys are interdisciplinary and you're looking across different, always different fields. As you look across the fields, what do you see are the biggest constraints for G's? You, you gave a great, for Nanotech, you gave a great example of how there's no one, most different sub industries don't have an incentive to lean heavily into Nanotech because the way they currently do things is cheaper and faster unless barring some like trillion dollar investment, right? So that's a great example. But more generally, of the things we talked about, mm -hmm. biotech, brain emulation, cryo, what are the main constraints preventing it from becoming more mainstream or, or even plausible? And kind of what would you, if you could wave a, a magic wand, what would you change to help these things be more likely to actually catch on and get the appropriate investment and attention they deserve. Maybe I'll start with two boring ones and then uh, I'll go to the bigger one. So the first one is what pops up across all the different fields is like data standardization. So mm -hmm. basically like in order to, for AI to make use of data and be useful for biology, you need data, like data aggregation, data standardization <laughs> for AI to be helpful. And like most of the time, we, humans are just not very good at <laughs> keeping metrics straight and even like sharing them openly, even if we have metrics that we're all using in, in a similar way. And that, that's a big, that would be a big unlock across, across different fields. That's number one. Second is the one that I already mentioned, which is regulatory willingness and mm -hmm. really just like the sheer cost to market that it often involves to bring anything out there, especially when it touches humans. And then I think the third one is like a bigger, more meta one that we're also trying to address with a program called existential hope. And that's basically like the fact that we like. We don't really want these things. <laughs> mm. We don't like, or at least we, we've forgotten to want them. Like when I look into Fawcett's archives, like people in 1986, they really wanted this stuff. They yeah. thought about nanotech, fusion, uh, AI, longevity, and they're just like, let's go out and get it. But at that point, the scientific and technological landscape wasn't really just quite ready yet. And now we could do this stuff. There's nothing really holding us back from it. We have the funding, we have as a civilization, we have the funding, we have the brain power, we have the tools that are coming online to do this stuff, but we've forgotten to want it. And so mm. I think a big one is this kind of, oh, if only we don't kill ourselves, it's going to be good. <laughs> if only we don't totally screw up the climate and learn to live on the planet, like without killing each other, ourselves, the environment, the biosphere, like that would be a big success. And I, th I think like that appetite for reaching higher is even for the people where it does exist, it's often being shunned because thinking that way makes you this like techno utopian that doesn't care about right. like real world problems. But that's really just not to say, of course we care about real world problems. You can do both. But I, it I, doesn't mean that some people also yes. don't have to look at what to build instead of it, because oftentimes you can solve real world problems by like just thinking ahead and thinking a little bit more ambitiously about what you could build. And if we had done that earlier, we would be not in a state where we'd have these real world problems now. <laughs> like we would just be in a very different world. And so I think that's kind of upsetting. And, and I think one thing, if you just look at it, I would love to be in a world where we, where the kind of like bottleneck to a better future is not interest in funding Hmm. research on it, but where it's actually limitations of knowledge after we research it. Hmm. If we actually, if we're like, okay, we're just going to spend the money that it takes to like research these like ambitious and like pretty beneficial te technological advances. And then we, and then we still don't know how to do it. That's fine. Then you can continue pushing at the frontier, but currently we don't even have the appetite. Like we started this whole brain emulation program and are currently raising for this like 20 million dollar whole animation endowment, but until we started even funding a little bit of that work over the last year, and that wasn't even with a lot of money, it's about $1.5 million total across different grants. Until then, there wasn't, there, there was no funder out there doing actually with a focus on whole brain animation. Different people were working on it across different labs on various different parts of it. So I'm not just saying that no one ever looked at it, but there was not like a funder out there that was like specifically, let's go, let's try to do this. And now in the past few years, if you have come online and, and this is now a thing that you can talk about. So I think we need to be able to like talk 
also more openly about the positive futures that we want to give others that want them to cover and to just open up the Overton window a bit and make it just a little bit more palatable to discuss these things. Because whenever we try to start doing that, it, we are surprised by how many people think the same way, but it's just not really pre prevalent on the internet uh, or on blog posts that you read or something, because why say something if no one else says something? But so I think, yeah, just- Well, it, it's cool to be cynical. It's cool to throw, it's easier to be cynical, to throw stones, to, to, uh, to lampoon something that's yeah. looking in the sky. It's easier. And I, I was guilty. I mean, I was playfully joking too about how, how kind of sci-fi this sounds. I personally find it's all enthralling. It's one reason why I wanted to talk to you. I'm so glad we did. And the next part of why I wanted you on the show is to actually do exactly what you're saying is to actually have some, is to be unafraid to think about the future, to think about, to consider possibilities, to think about, okay, let's actually, I mean, this can sound really corny, but like decades and decades and decades ago, when they try to say, let's get, a man on the moon, right? That is yeah. that is the kind of wild, outlandish thinking that we don't have much anymore. And I think it is so cool that Foresight is keeping that flame of hope alive. And I think it's so, I also, as I mentioned to you off mic in a prior conversation, I think you have one of the freaking coolest jobs on the planet because every day, <laughs> every day you're thinking of these different technologies and working to actually help in your own way and foresight's way make them a reality so thank you for that well thanks that means a lot i, I mean I, I do want to say maybe none of the specific technologies that i mentioned will pan out but like on the other hand like you can't build what you can't envision or what you can't imagine so i think the first step for even making possible to get anywhere is to start thinking about how to get there and we might still not but like if you don't even start making progress on it then you would just never get there by default so the bets are off on whether each of these technologies will work out but i think in general we just need to keep pushing at a lot of the different frontiers and yeah i would invite people <laughs> to to take that on and, and do that yourself and if, if you see others pushing don't necessarily pull them down but be like okay yeah i i support you in pushing it might not work but yeah maybe you can help Alice, a great note to end on. Thank you so much for all you do. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks again. Best of luck to you and Foresight. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was really fun. Well, there you have it. Thanks again to Allison Deutman, CEO of the Foresight Institute. Thank you to you, dear listeners and viewers. Hope you enjoyed. If it's your first time here, please consider subscribing, rating at five stars, liking, commenting, and in the comments, especially on the YouTube comments. I want to hear, let me, let me know what are you most excited about or what do you think is absolute pie in the sky? It's ridiculous. There's no way. Let me know. I'm curious. Thanks again. See you next time.